about this uh, title? Demon Trials? Question mark. What the heck? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to another episode of Plain Truth, a Holy Spirited podcast. I am Maggie Ulmer, and I am in the studio of United Theological Seminary with... Scott Kisker. David Watson. And we're talking about one of my favorite things today. We're talking... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I feel strange now because I was about to launch into it, and then I was like, wait, do I want people to think that's one of my favorite things? <laughs> no. Uh, what are we talking about? <laughs> what are we talking about? We're talking about uh, supernatural. The supernatural uh, realm of the world. Which would faith, be God. God, Jesus Christ, or is the good side of it. So we were going to talk about Calvinism. Scott wanted to talk about Calvinism. So we're going to talk about Calvinism on a later episode. Yeah. <clears throat> and why we're not Calvinists. Yes. Yeah. And, and hopefully and, just and deal of... with the actual biblical texts that are proofed. Apparently I don't know enough about it. The actual biblical texts. Well, you're the one who said that, not I don't, us. I don't, I don't have a nuanced enough perspective on it. <laughs> on Calvinism? Yeah. Well, yeah, you can't just say it's dumb. That's not an argument. I don't know. I think it works for a lot of people. <laughs> I'm just kidding, Calvinists. I don't think it's dumb. I just, <laughs> I just strongly don't agree. There are no Calvinists listening. Yeah, there are no Calvinists this. listening to this. So that's I have okay. Calvinist friends. They might listen out of pity for me. Yeah, I'm praying for your soul. Probably. Hopefully. No, Please no. Do. But, but what but... good would that do? <laughs> I know. I'm not part of the elect, so. <laughs> or aren't you? Or I don't know. You? you might be. See. That's but, so many questions, see, but let's. We're not talking about this today. We're no, we're not. We're, not. we're talking. A, well, okay. I listened Fairies. to the. No, we're not talking. <laughs> the, about that. the the latest episode of. I mean that that does come to bear on the discussion. The latest episode <laughs> of the Mars Hill podcast gave me a little bee in my bonnet because. How do you know it was a bee? Maybe it was a fairy. <laughs> it could have been a fairy in my bonnet, <laughs> but. Um, the whole thing about demon trials, which, look, I'm not Pentecostal, okay? I spent a lot of time um, for a number of years now in the charismatic world. Um, this podcast is kind of a Methecostal podcast. Um, this one you're speaking on, not the Mars Hill podcast. Right, this one, this one we're speaking on. and <laughs> Plain Truth, the Holy right Spirit now, podcast. Our podcast, yes. the one you, listener, are currently hearing. <laughs> you one, listener, we love you. <laughs> <laughs> Don't turn us off. <laughs> Please. So um, I've never heard of this. And apparently a lot of Pentecostals have never heard of this. Demon trials? Demon trials. I, now, I still have I didn't, because I n didn't listen to that part of the content. Uh, podcast. I listened to the first some ep episodes, but I didn't get that far. I still don't know what it. I still have heard you guys say it and don't know what it means. So apparently, like, a demon how do you trial, try a demon? Do you like, like bring him into the courtroom? You put on a wig, a white wig, <laughs> and a black robe. And you say, Mephistopheles, <laughs> you have been accused of. Well, I don't even know what this means. I mean, so there. I mean, the whole podcast is about. Mars Hill's Deliverance Ministry, which was kind of pioneered by Mark Driscoll and, and in some ways centered around him like everything else that Mars Hill did. Well, okay, but Mark... But they called Mark, it Demon Trials. They called them Demon oh, Trials. Oh, he called it that. Mark yeah, yeah. Driscoll called yeah. it that. I don't know if he made it up or heard it somewhere, but... I don't know. Usually the church just calls it Deliverance, yeah. which seems to have worked for the last, I don't know, 2,000 years or so. Yeah, it was not a very well... It, there was there was not much nuance no. in this episode, um, and it I thought it didn't deal with the topic of deliverance very well or accurately or accurately. Um, I have a question. Yeah. So, in the beginning of the podcast, there uh, the host of the podcast gives a little bit of quote unquote background on deliverance. Yeah. Do you think that that is Mars Hill's perspective, or that is the host's understanding of the history of deliverance? And I thought he was he was trying to provide some context, yeah, some context for this. And he he seems to believe that this is 
I mean, the way he talked about deliverance, maybe he doesn't believe this. I don't actually know what he believes, but the way he talked about it was like this is a 20th century phenomenon. Yeah, that was the part it comes that up out of Pentecostalism. made me want to crawl under a table and cry. Yeah, he is, he, that, that is just ignorant. Well, let's just, for the sake of our listeners, deliverance has been around for a long, 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 long time. In Scripture, there's deliverance and exorcism, and uh, Jews had deliverance rituals and practices. And, and uh, uh, it was actually a part of every baptism. That's right. Uh, probably up until Constantine is my guess for sure, uh, where everyone had to go through deliverance ministry before you were baptized. Yeah, and it's not always this. And it remains in our baptismal liturgy as the renunciation of Satan. Yes, which you know? please do that if you haven't. <laughs> but like, do you reject yeah, the, the evil forces. powers of this world? Exactly. And, you know, the spiritual forces of wickedness. wickedness. Mm -hmm. And in, you know, that assumes there are spiritual forces of wickedness. <laughs> One of, yeah. Who's, Which, yeah. Whose name is Satan? <laughs> Church lady <laughs> reference. Nice. nice, nice I had to work that in. Sorry. So, it tells you my age. Anyway, I just feel like that's a good thing to say since he's, the host seems to reference mostly early uh, 20th century. He really late, talked about century. sort of a modern Pentecostal understanding yeah. of it. But. Well, he gave a take on modern Pentecostal right. understanding of it, but I think that there are far, I mean, this talk, look, you can only do so much in one podcast, right? And so I don't want to like beat up on the guy or beat up on the podcast, but here's the thing, like, you know, in our evangelical episode a few weeks ago, we talked a a lot, well, a little bit at least, about deconstruction. I want to do a whole podcast on this topic, actually, yeah. deconstruction. But, you know, deconstruction really happens. Uh, I started writing an article for Firebrand on this, and I, I can't finish it. But deconstruction happens when what are called plausibility structures um, uh, break down. Okay, so you have a particular... Can, uh, I mean, it's not like one idea is independent of other ideas, right? right. You ideas are dependent on are, are interrelated, and and they form structures of belief. And so, what the reason people give up on the faith is because the structure of belief collapses. And I think you know, with a podcast like this one, part of what he offered was kind of a deconstructive critique of deliverance ministry without any kind of positive proposal or suggestion as to how this should take place. It's just all these all these bad things have been done. And he never says, you know, this isn't real or anything like that, although he did start out with uh, a reference to these, what are uh, they hoaxes. called? Hoaxes. The... Um, Cottingly Fairy. The Cottingly hoaxes of the early fairies. 20th century. Yes. 1917... Cottingly fairies, and and the moral of that was, um, people need something to believe in. People are searching for something to believe in, and so that makes a lot of people an easy mark. Is the implication for the kind of deliverance ministry that Driscoll was involved in? Well, <laughs> and and Jesus, yeah, <laughs> I was gonna, who also I was, you I was know say, cast out demons and things like that. The the. The thing that's interesting about spiritualism, so I, I went through a period of time when I was an early Christian, and I think I'll, I think a lot of baby Christians sometimes go through this too, where when I was a young Christian and I started to really sort of understand, oh, the supernatural isn't even just isolated uh, events, it's all the time, right? So God, God's order is, in essence, supernatural. I, you know, like a lot of uh, teenagers, I saw a couple of horror films, although I'm not very good for them. I'm, I've always been terrified by them. And, you know, played with a Ouija board at a, at a, a sleepover with a bunch of girls one time and all that stuff. So there are all of these things that I think we think are sort of innocent and, and stuff like that, that in some senses are doorways into exploring quote unquote spirituality or spiritual things mm -hmm. or supernatural things 
and this has been happening for a long, long time. Even the the spiritualism of the early uh, 1900s, this is this is not new. And like what we call quote unquote new age now, that's not new. It's right. the same old stuff, just we package it up differently. The mm-hmm. enemy is always coming up with mm-hmm. shinier bows and ribbons to put on mm-hmm. things. But yeah, there's nothing new in this stuff. No, I mean these practices have have gone on from time eternal. Mm-hmm. You know, I well, and yeah, and I mean, let me let me say this also about just I don't want to spend the whole time talking about this podcast. I mean, they did point out some practices that I you know that I wouldn't endorse, that I would never endorse. Uh, that Mark the, Driscoll's group yeah did. yeah that Mark Mark Driscoll's group such did. as and just for those of us who didn't actually listen to the podcast <laughs> I mean there was a lot of um, I felt like if I mean the way at least that the podcast portrayed the way they were doing this it felt like women were targeted with this a lot and especially over matters of sexual sin disproportionately so hmm. okay. She's a witch. Yeah, She's I was going to say, well, you know, we have well, that's like happened before too. It, it, it has, and I, I just want to say, look, I'm not, I'm not saying that the way that they went about it at Mars Hill was, you know, blameless or anything like that. Okay, so don't, don't, listeners, don't hear me saying. Don't that. tweet it, David. Okay, yeah, don't tweet at me. Come on. So <laughs> the, but, but. Okay, so we think that there were particular significant shortcomings in the way that they went about this mm-hmm. at Mars Hill. What's 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 missing? How should it be different? And what is its significance for the church today? Deliverance. You know, and and this is this is an issue that's kind of one of my, you know, one of my hobby horses that I've been riding for 20 years, which is the church has to fish or cut bait on certain issues, okay? One of those issues, for example, is divine action. Is God an agent or is God an idea? Is God just a concept that gives weight to our moral principles or is God um, an agent who will show up in our lives and do things? Another thing that the church has to fish or cut bait on is are there spiritual beings, good and ill, as described in Scripture, that inhabit this universe and come to bear on our lives. And if that's the case, we as the church are negligent if we don't figure out how to deal with these. But it seems to me, like, just because you talk about the the Coppingly or what was it? Cottingly. Cottingly fairies. Cottingly fairies, the, which are just photo, f- doctored photographs I mean, that somebody super, if black and white photographs they, in the early 1930s, somebody put out a, put a cutout. Like yeah. picture of yes. Marian or something. I mean, to our to our sort of very sophisticated, graphically trained eyes now, there's no way <laughs> that you could look at that and not see it for what it is. But which... people assumed photographs were. Oh yeah. You know, this... like like we, you know, it's a it's the deep fake of its day. Mm-hmm. Okay, so Although you know, it does look like a girl sitting in front of some dolls. I mean, that that's what <laughs> that's the what picture it looks, looks like. like. Yeah. yeah, but um. So it seems to me that to have confused this podcast, which, again, I didn't listen to, but that's never stopped me from having opinions before, um, has confused spiritualism, yes. which was a, a a movement of people who had left Christianity but were trying to find some spirituality in their lives in the early 20th centuries with the collapse of of sort of en- enlightenment um mm-hmm. the, the the you know the framework of the enlightenment which is of course what leads to deconstruction and postmodernity mm-hmm. uh after world war 1 and you know so you have this kind of interest in in you know there must be you know the, the world somehow must be filled with meaning and spirit and mm-hmm. whatever but they're not looking for it in Anything that Christianity would recognize as Christian, good. <laughs> uh, uh, but you know, on the last podcast we talked about empiricism. I mean, it is kind of an empiricist move, like the whole thing about like you know spiritualism. For example, it involves seances. Right, mm-hmm. you're well, trying I, to I, talk to the right, dead. Right, I, I can have proof that that there's something beyond this world because I can talk to Uncle Fred. Who, who, you know, went on to his reward right. uh, 30 years ago. <laughs> yeah. you know? Well, and, right. So yeah. what's fascinating about that is, well, first of all, Scripture very clearly says, please don't do that. 
That's not a good idea. Because <laughs> don't think the word please is in there. <laughs> <laughs> it says uh, don't do that. But so what's interesting though about that, right? The 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 notion of empiricism speaking to dear dead Uncle Fred um, is how do you know that that's who you're talking to? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and if if you are actually talking to them, they might be, you know pissed off like they might. <laughs> why are you bothering me? yes which is what um uh samuel, samuel. samuel why yeah. are you <laughs> when saul when saul Saul's dragged like, him back yes, yes. so um with saul. No, saul saul saul, yeah, saul. saul. Yeah, saul. <laughs> I was get like, those two straight yeah, yeah, uh, but, yeah. yeah there's a difference <laughs> yeah there's yeah. a difference yes so i think it, w- one of the things that is interesting is that we imagine that somehow we can tell the difference between uh, every sort of supernatural entity that's good or bad, but that's not the case. Scripture says over and over and over again, you have to test the spirits, and also you're not supposed to do these things in a vacuum by yourself. You you go to other people who are mature in the faith and you say, this is what happened. This is what the fruit of it was. What do you think about that? Does that line up with scripture? It sounds like there's something maybe a a little irresponsible going on in kind of lumping these things together um, as though deliverance, which has gone on in the church for thousands of years Mm -hmm. and (laughs) among the people of God for at least a thousand years before that, and this kind of uh, what was considered a serious thing in the early 20th century that has to do with the collapse of both enlightenment and com- confidence in the enlightenment and confidence in 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 Orthodox Christianity, mm-hmm. especially in its you know liberal forms as it came. But none of this was ever ex- you know Duke University had its uh, center for uh, sort of studying this, you like know, paranormal yeah, oh, a laboratory for parapsychology. This is in the like 1930s and something like this. And they, they, they got actual fun. I, people believed that this was a, a thing that you could investigate and that it could be a part, you know, parapsychology could be a part of. Well, maybe it is a thing you can investigate. Well, but maybe, the question yeah. is, what are the presuppositions you bring mm-hmm. to the investigation? And yeah. then what do you, I mean, also, I think there's a certain amount of um, I, I mean, I hesitate to use the word arrogance, but I, I'm always sort of galled by the idea that we think we can study this thing and then use it to our ends. Right. So that's the part that I'm like, what? Why do you think that's a thing? Have you ever seen the movie The Men Who Stare at Goats? Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking about funny. right now. You guys that guy have was to... really into Boston. Yeah, yes. <laughs> if you, <laughs> listeners, if you haven't seen this movie, you're gonna, you have to go see it. Because it kind of touches on the sort of the military use of this exact type of thing, using parapsychology to to visualize images. And what is that called? Uh, like astral. Well, you're kind of reading mind. It's an it's idea of like reading minds, yeah, too. Astral yeah, astral projection, that yeah. kind yeah. of stuff. killing goats. Or killing, you can kill goats with your mind. Yes. <laughs> right. The men who stared at goats. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, go see that movie. It's fascinating and super funny. But, 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 <clears throat> but know, anyway, but, this was a part of a reaction against a disenchanted mm-hmm. world yeah. uh, of sort of liberal Protestantism and, and scientism um, in the early 20th century. But it has, yeah, like not not really, I mean... I guess you could maybe see a connection between emerging Pentecostalism because it's contemporaneous, but it, just because things are contemporaneous doesn't mean they're actually the same thing. I think what I would say is that anytime there's a move of God, there's always a counterfeit. I think you often see that. So you see early Pentecostalism, early 1900s, you have all of this this outpouring of the Holy Spirit, Azusa Street, all of that. And then at the same time, you also have this rise or... It's been going on for a little while at that point, for a few decades, but this this rising notion of spiritualism and it's just becoming culturally adopted, and um, that's what it is. There's the real thing, which is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, manifestations of the Holy Spirit, and then there's the counterfeit, which the difference is is God is at the center of one, and that at the center of the other is the enemy trying to tell people, well, you can be at the center of that. 
And that's never the case. All supernatural things that are of God are for the edification and glory of God, not us. Right. I just, I feel like the church is, usually when these kinds of things come up, unless you're in Pentecostal or some Roman Catholic circles, I think, people just kind of avoid the issue. Oh, yeah. You know, what do we really think about these matters? What do we really think about the demonic? Is there such a thing? Oh, yeah. And, I mean, I know we, we think there is, but but the churches, I mean, churches. And Jesus apparently thought there Jesus was. Jesus thought there was, too. <laughs> yeah. And so did the apostles. Yeah. Well, and so did, so did people before Jesus. Yeah, so did people before Jesus. That's right. And so... In fact, the only people who didn't were people after the Enlightenment. <laughs> so this very small period of time <laughs> between like the the late 1600s to uh, apparently the late 1800s. So 200 years people. And, and interestingly enough, you also have the Romantic period in the 1800s where people mm. are already reacting against this kind of. So it's maybe a hundred years. <laughs> it's kind of fascinating, really. I mean, I don't know if and the sixteen hundreds is when you have all the witch trials. So obviously, people believe it. You know. So it's but but I've had people in I've had people contact me over the years, and they'll say, you know, David, I need advice on something, or I need help with the situation in my church. I don't know what to do, and you're the only person I know that takes this seriously. Oh, that's sad. And and I'll be like. You really probably should talk to Pete Bellini. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, let me give you Pete's number. <laughs> um, you know, this isn't my wheelhouse. I'll provide counsel as I'm able, but I also would recognize I could get over in over my head really quickly in this stuff. I remember, I remember you telling me a story about a house you went to. Mm-hmm. Did you tell that on the podcast? Mm-mm. I I won't tell the whole story, but um, yeah, I mean, listen. Yes, I, I, I would not say that that was a that was a house blessing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I went to a house blessing, and um, you know, sometimes people ask for things indirectly. You know, um, there are all kinds of different cries for help, and so somebody had asked for a house blessing, and um, anybody can bless a house, but uh, at that particular time, uh, my husband was actively pastoring a church and so he led the house blessing and I went and just prayed and um, I will tell you that there was very obviously something happening now to be clear just because you see something strange doesn't mean it's automatically demonic there can also be psychological issues Mm -hmm. and and it's not an either or it's a both and like we're material beings. We have neurochemistry happening. Um, so, but there there was um, a very obvious material manifestation of something that was very clearly not okay. And one thing I will say is, is whenever a material I, manifestation, yeah, very f- physical. Um, I I mean I I don't I don't want to. I don't want to uh, break confidence or privacy of someone that I prayed with, but I, I do feel like I can share this because it's visible from the outside of the house. So whenever I'm going to pray with someone or for someone, or sometimes there are pastors who will be doing deliverance or inner healing, and they'll call me and ask me to pray while they're praying, and I'll listen and watch in the spirit. So I was praying, preparing to go bless this house with my husband, and what the Holy Spirit showed me was that the house was shrouded in darkness, almost like a like a, a black curtain was over the house. Well, when we pulled up to the house, it was a, a large house with a lot of front-facing windows, and every single window, every single window had tinfoil pressed into the window frames, and on the inside were heavy black curtains. So... So something had been going on in this house. <laughs> yes, there was something <laughs> happening in that house. So I, I'm, that's all I'll share. But I, I'll say that every single room. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
So, but see that, you know, this is well, and I, I'm just it's similar to this. So I, I got uh, when I was a member of another church, the pastor of that church got invited by a parishioner who had bought a house for almost no money here in Dayton, for um, because she needed a place for her and her grandchildren to live. And the reason the house was as cheap as it was is it had been a uh, uh, basically a drug den and mm. uh, used for prostitution, and people had died there. Oh, Lord have mercy. And her daughters, or granddaughters, or grandchildren, I, don't, I think they were all girls, as I recall, wouldn't go up to the second floor. And uh, And they were all frightened. They would all only sleep in, like, one room of the house. So... <laughs> this pastor friend of mine was like, uh, I have no experience with this. Can you help me? And so I was like, all right, we'll, 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 we'll go do this. So anyway, we went and, well, if you want to call it a house blessing, that's basically what we were doing. But there were, we had, I mean, you know, is it, did we imagine it? Whatever. I don't know. Um, but we experienced like, uh, physical Oppressive. feelings of, mm -hmm actual temperature of cold fluctuation yeah mm -hmm. and and we we're like you know it could be me right i'm not i'm not saying that but one of the whatever whatever it was and the kids weren't there when we were there um after we did that the kids had no problem going upstairs that's right they I, went and they slept upstairs in their bedrooms and they had no problems i think that this is the best point to make so and this is this is one of my major problems with the podcast is the the, is the other the podcast. other podcast, not the, our podcast. podcast. I have zero problems with this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what you said before we started Stop. recording. <laughs> Don't pull back the curtain. <laughs> um, Don't break the fourth wall. That's right. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, that's all podcasting is. <laughs> it's, anyway, um, no, is that. It's this whole sort of theatrical aspect of the notion of a demon trial. That is not what it is like. Listen, it's not that weird stuff can't happen. Weird stuff can happen. Weird, I, weird stuff has happened. I'll, I'll tell you once I watched my husband give communion to a woman. She would not touch the host. And when she took it into her mouth, broke out into a drenching sweat. Like, like. Wet pouring down her face. Wait, is that indicative of a problem? <laughs> <laughs> so, yikes. So, you know, listen, I've, I, that's that's a small example of a st strange things I've seen. So, it's not that strange things can't happen, but a lot of times it's very boring. A lot of blissfully, thank you, Jesus. Why? Because it's not based on me, it's not based on what I do. So much deliverance is about faith and obedience. You don't have to even come up with your own words. You read scripture, you know, use the book of uh, worship. Say a prayer for someone in the name of Jesus Christ. I break off the schemes of the enemy or whatever it is that you're going to say. And you have faith that God shows up and does something. Do you ask questions. You you know, how are you feeling? Do you hear anything? Things like that. But it doesn't always have to be this big theatrical thing. I don't like the emphasis on that. Because Did the Mars Hill podcast make it seem like this was like no, I don't a think circus so. or something? No, I don't think so much. I mean, here's the thing. Here's here's the thing about this podcast. I I believe. Go ahead, Maggie. Well, I was just going to say that I think that the the host of the podcast certainly makes it sound a little bit uh what's the word i'm looking for like so a little dramatic yeah a little bit the podcast as i you were all super high on this podcast when you started listening to it i i think the tone has changed of it actually i think at at the beginning um and i listened to the first the, what i liked about it was that it was it was not just they, they showed Mars Hill Church as not just all one thing. There were mm -hmm. good things that happened, and there were bad things that happened. And, and both of those things are to be taken seriously. And it seems like as it's gone on, the focus has really become more on the bad things. Mm -hmm. And I think that the podcast, and, and I'll continue to listen to it, but I think that the podcast is actually a critique 
of larger trends in evangelicalism using Mark Driscoll as kind of a larger than life figure who exemplifies these. So for so example, he's the, a foil. So he's a foil. Mm-hmm. So the hyper masculinity, for example, or, or uh, the focus on one single charismatic leader, you know, um, touch not the Lord's anointed, these mm-hmm. kinds of things. You know, I think that the podcast is shining light on legitimate problems that were at Mars Hill and legitimate problems that are within evangelicalism. Then when it moved into this episode on the demon trials, I think it was shining light on a problem that is not typical within evangelicalism. I I think I've as again, you know, I spend a lot of time in a lot of different kinds of churches. I've never heard of a demon trial. Yeah. <laughs> I've never heard of a demon trial. And so, you know, this sounds like it, it was a particular issue within this congregation. And then um, there was, you know, some talk about sort of the excesses that we've all seen in deliverance ministry mm-hmm. um, and things like, you know, I cast out of, you know, you let's say you have arthritis in your, in your hand. I cast out the arthritis demon from your hand, you know, stuff stuff like that. And... And I just, I just want to say, well, yeah, but that, yes, there are these excesses, but we don't judge movements by their worst excesses. No, yeah. You know, that, that on the whole, these are outliers. Well, especially when it's not real. I mean, deliverance is not really a movement. It's just a part, Spiritual been a part practice, of Christianity yeah. for ever. You know, I mean, it's yeah, not right, like this right, is right. <laughs> right. It's not like this is new, or so, some new development, or something like that. Right. In fact, I think that the loss of deliverance or exorcism or whatever you want to call it in kind of the post Enlightenment church is the anomaly. Well, it's not the post. It's the Enlightenment church that where it was lost. I mean, you think about it. And, and, and continuing oh, to the mm-hmm. post Enlightenment church. Uh, yeah, and I would, I would, I, I think since. Uh, you know, Pentecostalism emerges in the early 20th century, and and th- it actually existed also within the holiness movement, mm-hmm. Methodism, prior to that, and it was never really completely went away. Um, but um, among respectable, right, it just became again, an undignified, mainline, dirty respectable, secret. Respectable mm-hmm. uh, quote Christians unquote who who don't really need Jesus either. <laughs> <laughs> so certainly aren't possessed by devils. We're just good middle class people who, you know, um, it it wasn't ever mentioned, right? And you were embarrassed by, mm-hmm. you know, this is that whole uh, uh, genre of of biblical interpretation where you're basically embarrassed by anything supernatural happening mm-hmm. in the pages of the Bible. So you skip over those things, and mm-hmm. it becomes a metaphor for, you know, something else. Yeah, I think you know. Jesus, you know, fed 5,000 because the people ended up sharing. <laughs> oh, gosh. I've heard that so many times. No. One, of the, one of the things that I, I wish that we took more seriously is, you know, a, discuss, a, a seri- more serious discussion of the, the sort of... If we took conversations around deliverance more seriously, I think we would have... Um, uh, obviously less need for it. <laughs> I mean, that sounds like an obvious people statement. People might avoid uh, the demonic if oh, they believed gosh. in it. You know, that might be, you well, know. It's just, it's just C.S. Lewis quote about that. Uh, it's, oh, oh, it's in the screw tape letters where yeah. you know, the, 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 the main thing to do is to get people to not believe in you and mm-hmm. therefore they're, they're basically sitting ducks for, That's for, correct. for demonic. You know, uh, the, one, of the, one of the things that the church has to reckon with is that essentially the entire New Testament (laughs) from Matthew to Revelation is predicated on the idea that the the evil that we see in this world corresponds to an evil that exists in the supernatural. I mean, Revelation, I mean, what is Revelation except kind of a pulling back the veil on reality. The book of Revelation. Yeah, the book of Revelation. The Revelation of John. Pulling back kind of the veil on reality and looking at reality from a 
heavenly perspective. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, you know, we see, for example, the persecution of the saints. But who's behind the persecution of the saints? You know, uh, well, let's let's say um, that we want to talk about the evil of the Roman Empire. Well, that becomes manifest, and the evil of the imperial cult. That becomes manifest in the figure of these two beasts in Revelation 13. But who empowers the two beasts, right? The dragon mm -hmm. gives his power to the beast. And who's the dragon? The dragon is Satan. And so if we believe that the New Testament teaches us about the nature of reality, then we have to take seriously the fact that there is not just uh, that that evil isn't just the product of human decisions but that there is a spiritual component to evil that is real and intentional and comes to bear on our lives in very significant ways amen well and we're coming into um what uh our friend Dr. Pipolini likes to call um, spiritual flu season. <laughs> What's spiritual flu season? <laughs> it's this whole sort of, you know, occultic harvest season leading up mm -hmm. to All Saints Eve mm -hmm. and All Saints Day or All Hallows Eve and Halloween. Well, and I think that probably that it's also, it's because paganism is mm -hmm. connected to nature worship mm -hmm. and so both and uh springtime and harvest as it were <laughs> are I, are times when absolutely. pagans have big holidays yes although i would say i i think it tends to be a little more pronounced around halloween because we have culturally adopted the celebration of the macabre and the occultic in our you know costumes and in parties and all things like this. And we've talked about this before on the podcast. It's not that spider webs and, you know, headstones are inherently evil or anything like that. But, you know, people do all kinds of things. You know, I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna debate, but I mean, have you ever seen what goes on at spring break or Mardi Gras? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? No, I, mean, I don't do those things. <laughs> but you know. <laughs> Scott, are you going to... Um, are you going gonna, on spring are break? Are you going to continue your tradition of yearly seance at your house on Halloween? <laughs> <laughs> All right. I want to just state for the record <laughs> that David is making stuff up. And please tweet him. <laughs> because you can't tweet me, so ha, ha, ha. But no, that would never, ever happen in my home. I yeah. just wanted it stated for the record. Well, we, we just like uh, Scott was referencing with the C.S. Lewis, you know, we have sort of um, infantilized or turned these things into little little jokes and we don't take them very seriously. And in, in doing so, we invite, <laughs> we like open the door and we're like, hey, come on in, you know, have a seat, hang out at my house, things like that. But. You know, don't do that. <laughs> don't have seances. Don't play with tarot cards. Don't do astral projection. Not an appropriate way to interact with the Holy Spirit. Because I don't even know what that is, but you're I, not interacting with the Holy Spirit. I, I I I hope that this is well. You know, that that this could go without saying is my hope. No, I don't think that it does. I think that there are don't hold seances. No, I really don't. I think that there are, in particular, quite a few. Um, people in their early 20s in particular, late teens, early 20s, who are, are gravitating towards things of the spirit because, why? Because the things of the material world uh, have in, in some sense failed them. Like, you know, go to college, you're gonna get a job, you're gonna do all this. Okay, that stuff has not been working out very well lately. You can be anything, anything you, you want. want. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, see, you guys needed, um, you needed to grow up in in our generation where yeah, we didn't care right. about anything. <laughs> so so grew up with parents who grew up in the depression. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that was my dad. Don't throw away that box. That's a good box. Yeah. But um the the one one other thing about the the podcast episode, the Marshall podcast episode was the narrative kind of made it sound like um 
that there was this kind of current of, I don't know, um, deliverance ministry and Pentecostalism. But in the 1970s, The Exorcist came out. Oh, gosh, and, yeah. And then when The Exorcist came out, um, that was at the same time as the uh, charismatic movement was making its way into a lot of mainline churches. Mm-hmm. It's like when Aldersgate Renewal Ministries was getting off the ground, for example. And uh, so that sensationalized this process of deliverance and, and made it an even more theatrical thing. I'm not suggesting that that never happened, but I, I don't, I just don't see the correspondence there. You mean b- between what the movie caused and the culture? Yeah, and, and the practices of charismatic Christians. No. And the movie itself, The Exorcist, is based on an actual story that happened. I always looked at The Exorcist as a cautionary tale. I mean, so... <laughs> what, Don't steal it, stuff out of Egyptian graves. <laughs> is that in The Exorcist? No, it's, yeah. I think in The Exorcist 2 or 3 with James Earl Jones. I don't P- remember. Pazuzu. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's the name of the, the Listen, demon Pazuzu. I, I'm... But, I mean, I, I've told you many, many times, I cannot watch horror films. I don't like them at all. I have seen that one. And if you think that I saw that movie and then thought, you know what? I should see the other ones that come after. You crazy. <laughs> so, so at the beginning of The Exorcist, w- Linda Blair mm-hmm. is playing with a Ouija board. Yes. and Which is a bad idea. And yes. then who does she encounter in the Ouija board? But someone named Captain Howdy, <laughs> <laughs> who we learned in either the Exorcist is or a three, demon, is actually named Pazuzu, and it's some kind of Assyrian god or something like that. Mm-hmm. And oh. so then Captain Howdy gets loose. I just want to say, Jesus protect us right now <laughs> <laughs> from Captain Howdy. <laughs> don't don't joke. <laughs> <laughs> Captain Howdy gets loose, and then the events that we all remember so vividly from that movie, Transpire. Pea soup, projectile vomiting. Yeah. I mean, what that movie was a, 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 a fictionalized depiction of was full possession. Right. Which is not common. Right. What a lot of people experience is things like harassment, spiritual mm-hmm. harassment. You can experience spiritual attachment. And then... Uh, a sort of more s- serious version of attachment would be oppression. Or maybe there's just, you know, you an area of your life w- that you cannot get free of. So we ca- see that commonly in addiction. Right. So, um, and it's not like you're off murdering people or, and it's not like you're manifesting demonically uh, up and down in church or anything like that, but there's just like this one area of your life that you just are like, I can't seem to have control over that. Where you are enslaved to sin. Exactly. Which means you are enslaved to the author of sin. Correct. Right. And Cap- and that would Captain be a, Howdy. Right, a type of compartmentalized <laughs> oppression. And so, but what what is depicted in The Exorcist, that would be full-on possession, where you no longer have control of your faculties, of anything. And and as far as I'm aware, that doesn't happen very often. Good. Yeah. That's good. Because it seemed wicked bad in the movie. It seemed so very bad. That's (laughs) why I said it's a cautionary tale. (laughs) Cautionary tale. I feel like... Your kid comes home with a Ouija board. Let me show you something. (laughs) (laughs) Nope. (laughs) Everywhere all over the country, for all seven of our listeners, people are throwing Ouija boards out in the trash, Mm -hmm. which you should. As they should. Don't invite Captain Howdy into your home. Or anything. Anything. Yeah. So... uh, uh, this fascination with with we what did Pete said to me once we were talking about uh, things related to deliverance and things like that and he was saying in the West people uh, were so egalitarian about everything that we make all all spirits the same we don't want to call some spirits bad and some spirits <laughs> good because that just feels not nice we could hurt their feelings feels unfair yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. y'all there are bad ones. Mm-hmm. And there are good ones. Amen. Thank you for them. Uh, yes, there are messengers am- of heaven. 
angelic spirits and mm-hmm. there is the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. Praise the Lord. Yeah. So. Where I think you? I may have encountered a good spirit yesterday. Um, because Sierra was driving. Uh-huh. And, she, and you didn't die. <laughs> did. Oh, dear. We came close. <laughs> oh, and dear. A car, like, in a parking lot pulled right out, like, right out in front of us. And I, I just yelled as loud as I could, look out! <laughs> and she swerved. I don't know how. I thought, I was just waiting for the... <laughs> this car in our, they were like merged atoms. <laughs> They were so close they, to each other. The, the, the atoms managed to pass through the spaces between the atoms. Right. Like, oh, That's I mean. what happened yeah. in this car. And the guy even got out of his car to inspect the damage, which wasn't there because we didn't hit him. I was like, Jesus Thank is you, real. Jesus. I said some, I said that later. I said some other things <laughs> at the time. <laughs> said some other things at the time I shouldn't have said. But Well, I, I here's a weird story that I can share in full. When I was in culinary school, going to school in Pittsburgh, I was sitting outside of a coffee shop eating lunch with a bunch of students like we did. And uh, I was facing, sitting at a patio table outside of this coffee shop, and I was facing the street, which was 7th Avenue, downtown Pittsburgh. Right across the street was a, uh, a parking garage, you know, like a with you could see cars you know it was an open parking garage not a what we in the midwest call a or further west call a parking ramp there you go okay and so there and it wasn't a very tall one there might have been like five stories six stories maybe something like that so anyway um looking out across the street just whatever hanging out and all of a sudden a car drives off the parking ramp towards the sidewalk yikes Yep. So breaks through the concrete barrier towards the, towards the street and sidewalk, hits a light pole, flips, lands on the top. So me and That's all... That's got to be bad. It, it was bad. <laughs> if you're in the car or walking yeah. on the street. So fortunately, no one was on the street at that point. I mean, initially, the, the car crashing through the concrete barrier was pretty loud. So we all watched it happen. Um, but presumably, it fell rather quickly. So if had you been under there, it would have... Oh, yeah. Well, it was across. I mean... Not you. Yes. If but one had been under yes. there, it would have been... You would have been running. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, um, we all jumped up and surprisingly started running towards the car so we started to run towards the car and I was praying as I ran I was about 19 I think at this point and uh uh not surprisingly prayer wasn't like a super regular part of my life at that point (laughs) it was more like emergency prayers like that Mm -hmm. and I said oh my gosh Jesus please please don't let that person be dead and I heard an audible voice say don't worry She's fine. Hmm. And I stopped in the middle of the street. Stopped in the middle of the street. Then I saw a man come around to the side of the car and help her out of the car. And she stood up. You know, the woman who had been driving the car stood up and was just standing there, obviously in shock. Then, of course, there was just like a flood of paramedics and all this stuff like that. So um, later on, there was... uh, a news story about this accident, whatever happened. And you read the account and in this woman's account, she talks about how she crawled out of the car. I thought to myself, this is so strange because I saw someone pull her out of the car. This is really weird. But then I just thought, you know, whatever, you know, I don't see everything correctly. And she's clearly been she through something there. traumatic yeah, right, and right. she would know. Right. So or, I didn't... or she misremembered too. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, so anyway, one of the people I was eating lunch with is was just one of those guys who like knows everybody and their mother. Like he had a thousand jobs and was also in culinary school, and he's pretty sure he sold pot. And anyway, um, he was just <laughs> this. I don't know. He Thanks was for that tidbit. All right. Well, I mean, he was sometimes he had connections. Yes, yeah, so sometimes there's in... a reason why people know everybody. Right. <laughs> so. Anyway, I was talking to him because he was sitting at the same table where I was. I was talking to him about it later, and I said, I saw someone pull 
that lady out of the car. And he's like, really? He said, yeah, I, I thought I did. I could be wrong. And he's like, huh. So then like a week later, sit and lunch, same thing. And here comes that guy with the lady walking across the street. Mm. And he's like, Maggie, tell her. And I said, tell her what? You know, uh, oh, well, I thought I saw someone pull you out of the car. And she's like, someone did pull me out of the car, but he wasn't there. Someone pulled me out of the car and I turned to say thank you and he was gone. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. Like, and I said, what do you mean gone? She's like, he pulled me out of the car. I was holding his hand. She said she was still holding his hand, turned to look at him. No one was there. And I said, all right, okay, maybe we saw something. And she said she just never said anything to the accident report person because she was like, that sounds crazy. And they were like, no, there was no one here and, you know, whatever. So what I want to know is how do you accidentally drive through a concrete barrier out of a car parking ramp? <laughs> yeah. that's, that's, there's part of this story that seems implausible to me. Well, not, I not the not that you are not, not that it didn't happen, but like. Well, I don't know if you, you, you know, want, you know, if you were parked there, you accidentally put it in drive instead of reversed it. Or... <laughs> no, I, I don't think that was it. Actually, I don't know if you if you know about women's shoes. They're ridiculous and they have straps on them sometimes. And this was the uh, late 90s, early 2000s, where there was a horrible, horrible fashion trend for strappy sandals and stiletto heels. And she got stuck on her. Cast. Is that really what happened? Yes, that's really what happened. That's happened to me before. I mean, not that I go around wearing stiletto heels anymore, but <laughs> late 90s, early 2000s. Yeah. Wow. Well, so there's a ridiculous story for you. Oh, well, that would be a a good spiritual presence. Yeah, if it was what it was, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I thought, always thought that was fascinating. But I also just heard this voice, and I had complete peace, confidence that she was going to get out of that car fine. Yeah, I'm, that's amazing. Anyway, Agreed. but so y'all don't have seances or don't invite any darkness into your life. Yeah. Well, we should have Pete on. He can tell us about all the all the things you shouldn't do. It's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Also, uh, demon trials. Not a thing. Not a thing. <laughs> I don't, I never don't think it. so. Yeah. I mean, if demon trials are like witch trials, I think we know how those went. Well, except that we already know the demon. If there if there are genuinely demons, they're already guilty. That's there's correct. No need for a trial. <laughs> there's really no need for a trial. <laughs> right. And anyway, how would you manage to punish one prior to uh, final judgment? I'm not. You know, that's the that's the actual demon trial right there. <laughs> You guys, that's been our podcast for today. It might be 15 minutes. We don't know. Um, thanks for listening. You think there's that much good content? <laughs> we didn't even get to talk about the Cottingley Fairies. We did, actually. I know, but... And how anyone ever believed that this was real. I want to. I, I do want to read. I mean, I pulled up the Wikipedia. I, I am curious. Was this real? I mean, it was obviously a hoax. And, of course... Somebody believed it, but did a lot of people did? I, no, I don't think so. I mean, it's I, like it's like a if if a little boy took like like his teddy bear and set it beside him, and then he was like, and look, then said, "Daddy, the teddy bear angel came to see me," you know, and then it became a big scandal. Like that's pretty or, much the equivalent. Or or like, look, Daddy, I have. You know, pictures of my dwarf, my, my garden <laughs> right, gnome right. traveling right. the world. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, mm, mm Yeah. Anyway. So the moral of the story is don't. Buy a garden gnome. <laughs> have demon trials. <laughs> don't have demon trials. trials. Don't invite Captain Howdy into your home. <laughs> or uh, any other demonic force. Yeah. I. Mm, well, I hope we've don't, done due don't, diligence. Don't play with evil. Yeah, evil's real. Definitely don't play with it. Um, that's been our podcast today. And uh, Jesus have mercy on our souls. Check out our Twitter account 
uh, at Holy Spirit Pod. Check out Spirit and Truth's Twitter, of which this podcast is a ministry, at Spirit Truth Life. Give us a like on our uh, Apple iTunes page. Rate the podcast. It helps people find us. And clearly, we want as many people listening to this as possible. Um, <laughs> God bless you guys. Have a great week. We'll come back to you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.